Chapter Twelve of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Comb Builders. In the foregoing chapters, an attempt has been made to show that the honey bee lives and moves and has her being in a world which must be actuated by something better than mere instinct in the common usage of the term to the modern biologist the earnest out-of-door student of life under all its manifestations this may appear as a rather obvious and unnecessary gilding of gold and the only question yet undecided may seem to be where in the scale of reason the honey-bee is to find her equitable place all bee-lovers must plead guilty to an inveterate partisanship the writer frankly among their number there is no laodiceanism in bee-craft and all the world over it may be said that where a few beehives have been got together there is always to be found a red-hot enthusiast not far off the word freemasonry in the english tongue has grown to be a synonym for the truest fraternity but just as real and almost as far-reaching is the brotherhood among keepers of bees no doubt among themselves the tendency is rather to magnify the virtues and achievements of their charges to be over lavish of inference from too scanty or too isolated facts and the proved impossibility of having anything to do with the honey-bee without being carried away sooner or later on a high crest of enthusiasm makes any attempt at holding the balances truly between the zealous bee-lover and the interested but temperate-minded reader a difficult and delicate task any writer on the honey-bee nowadays must be reckoned an ultra-specialist in an age of specialism and here it is not easy to preserve the sense of proportion undimmed especially for one admittedly speaking out of the ranks of beemanship where all are aiders and abettors in ardour impatient of any estimation falling short of high water mark the story of the comb builders however sets none of the usual pitfalls in the way of the over enthusiastic penman in its soberest incident and least important detail it is so wonderful that exuberance of language is as powerless to exaggerate as a niggardly tongue to minimise its true and due effect if the ordering of the bee commonwealth the intricate systems of sanitation division of labour treatment of the queen and worker larvae and the like is subject for marvel and seems infallibly to denote the possession of high faculties a much greater degree of acumen must be conceded to the worker bee when we come to consider her as the designer and builder of honeycomb it is here that she shines in her most significant light the complicated structures with which she fills the bee city do not call for unwearying toil alone they could never have been fashioned unless the combined arts of engineer architect and mathematician had been brought to bear on them nor are they merely simple constructive and mathematical problems which the honey-bee is called upon to face nor though difficult unvarying and so amenable to instinctive solution in almost every comb built we see special and necessarily unforeseen difficulties met and triumphantly overcome in the construction of the six-sided cell 
with its base composed of three roms or diamonds the bee has adopted a form which our greatest arithmeticians admit to be the best possible for her requirements and she endeavours to keep to this form wherever practicable but it constantly happens in her work of comb building that local conditions interfere with her plans and then she will make five-sided cells or square cells or triangular or any other form just as the need impels her it is a facile comfortably finite thing to put all this down to a mysterious essence called instinct with which the organism of the bee has been divinely dosed as men serve electricity to a laden jar but it was not instinct that made wren put the steel cable round the dome of st paul's nor instinct that lifted the crown stones to the top of the great pyramids these are works of a creature more highly equipped and instigated yet their supremacy is all of a piece with the honeycomb which is made of a material fragile light as air but which by the art of the bee becomes capable not only of supporting but of suspending a weight thirty times as great as its own that the bee does not collect her building materials but derives them from her own body is a fact that has come to light only within the last hundred and fifty years or so although several shrewd guesses at the truth are to be found in the works of the medieval bee masters the wasp who has much of the ingenuity of the honey bee but is doomed to exercise it in a far more humble direction makes a six-sided cell but her matter is collected from outside and can only be put to comparatively simple uses as it is incapable of bearing tensile strain beeswax alone of all constructive materials in the world seems to meet every requirement it can be worked into plates as thin as the one hundred and eightieth part of an inch which is the normal thickness of the cell wall it is indestructible to all the elements save heat it can be rendered soft and easily workable or allowed to harden while still retaining its suppleness and life it is a bad conductor of heat and therefore conserves the heat of the hive vermin do not prey upon it so far as is known there is only one creature that will eat it a peculiar kind of moth larva against which however a strong stock can always hold its own and then as the raw materials for its production are secretions of the bee's own body the work of preparing it can be carried on when darkness or stress of weather have put an end for the time being to work out of doors the first labour undertaken by a swarm directly it has gained possession of its new quarters is the building of combs the apparent revulsion of feeling which succeeds the excitement of swarming soon passes off and the energies of the whole party are at once concentrated on furnishing and victualling the new hive the older bees commence foraging each bee as she goes forth hovering a moment with her head towards the hive to fix its location and appearance in her memory by far the greater portion however remain at home and unite in a dense cluster for wax making time is everything in these first operations of the new colony the queen with whom egg laying has probably been suspended for a day past or even longer is overburdened with fecundity 
and must be supplied with thousands of brood cells without delay. The foragers will be coming home laden with nectar and pollen, and will need instant storage room. Wax must be made with all possible expedition, and the young bees crowd together in the roof of the hive, with their queen snug and warm in their midst. No doubt one of the chief reasons why swarming bees unite themselves in the solid pendant mass of the cluster so soon after leaving the parent hive is to hasten this process of wax formation. It has been proved that wax is most easily generated under the influence of great heat, and this is well secured in the heart of the cluster. By the time the scouts have decided on the new home, and the swarm must rise again on the wing, a great number of the bees will have their wax pockets filled, and will be ready for the work of comb-making. When a swarm is hived, even if it be only a short time after its issue, the little white wax scales can be seen protruding from the armour joints of many of the bees and these are often dropped and lost in the general confusion. One of the most difficult things to observe in bee life is the actual process of comb building. The crush is so great, and the movement of the bees so incessant, that at first the comb seems to grow of itself, rather than be made by the busy multitude, for ever obscuring it from the watcher's eyes, or giving him but the rarest glimpse now and then of its white, delicate frailty of pattern. These early efforts of the comb-builders, produced as they are under forced circumstances, are occasionally faulty of design, as though hastily knocked together. Sometimes the first groups of cells made by a swarm will have a yellow, moist, spongy appearance with thick, irregular walls, and are obviously little more than temporary vats to hold the incoming nectar until the proper honey cells can be constructed. This emergency comb is specially interesting as affording one more instance of the worker bee's ever-ready resource in the presence of difficulties. In the ordinary way, the mason bee hangs quietly in the cluster until her wax-secreting organs have done their work, and the six little oblong scales of brittle material are ready for manipulation. These protrude from under the hard plates of her abdomen, three on each side, looking much like half-posted letters. At one of the knee joints of her hind leg, she has a peculiar implement, of which there is not the slightest trace in the queen bee. This is like a pair of nippers, but instead of two converging points, it is furnished on one side with a row of sharp, stiff bristles, and on the other with a shallow spoon. With this special tool, the worker bee grips the wax scale and draws it out of its pocket. It is then transferred to her jaws, and she hurries off with it to the comb building. Arrived at an unfinished cell, she sets to work to chew up the raw wax into a paste, incorporating it with her saliva, and materially increasing its bulk. The resulting soft, ductile matter is then applied to the work, and moulded into its needed shape. In this way, with hundreds of workers going and coming, the delicate white fabric of brood and honeycomb is built up with extraordinary rapidity. How the coarse spongy comb, which swarms will sometimes manufacture, is produced cannot be definitely stated. It has all the appearance of having been made from raw wax, 
hurriedly masticated and kneaded up with honey and probably this is its actual composition the secretion from the salivary gland is necessarily slow and with time pressing and a horde of impatient foragers dinning about her ears eager to unload and be off again to the clover the ingenious mason bee appears to have hit on the idea of using the contents of her honey sack as a substitute nothing however but a mechanical admixture can take place between honey and the raw wax this dissolves only under the influence of the bee's saliva which has intensely acid properties to understand all that the bees have accomplished when a new empty hive has been filled throughout with waxen comb it is necessary to follow the operations of the swarm pretty closely during the first few weeks of its separate life it is a big undertaking the building of an entire new bee city and the problems that confront the builders are many and complicated in the first place whether she ever attains it or not the worker bee will aim at nothing short of perfection hereditary experience tells her exactly what are the home requirements of the colony and she now sets to work to fulfil them in the best imaginable way a city is to be built which is to accommodate twenty or thirty thousand individuals vast nursery quarters must be constructed as there may be as many as ten or twelve thousand youngsters to cradle at one and the same time for at least six months of the year no food will be obtainable from outside so that the city must contain large storehouses capable of holding more than a six months supply as the temperature in winter can be kept up only by the bodily warmth of the inhabitants life in the city must be concentrated into the smallest possible space and the materials of which the city is built must be heat conserving while its construction must allow of perfect ventilation at all times and in summer it must permit a free circulation of air that the surplus heat can be readily carried off the city must be a fortress as well as a home and be closed in on every side as a protection against its many enemies as well as the weather there is another and just as vital a condition governing its construction the necessity for strict economy in material if there were any natural substance having the qualities of tenacity lightness ductility and strength which the bees could obtain out of doors instead of wax no doubt they would use it for comb building and they would not spend hours of precious time and consume large quantities of hard-won stores in the manufacture of their own material but it seems there is nothing in nature possessing the needful properties bees collect a resinous substance notably from the buds of the poplar which they use for stopping up crevices they dilute this also into a varnish with which they paint the finished combs and sometimes even combine it with wax to form a rough filling but it appears to be useless in cell construction the whole city must needs be made of wax and wax alone and the bees are as careful of this precious substance as a miser of his gold starting with these conditions efficient house accommodation for the colony secured at the least cost in time labour and material the bee tackles the problem before her with an ingenuity that is little short of astounding 
she appears to begin with the central dominant unit of the difficulty and to work outward vanquishing subsidiary problems as she goes her line of reasoning seems to run somewhat in this way to raise the young and store the honey there is needed some kind of cell or receptacle the young larvae being cylindrical in form a cylindrical cell is indicated and this shape will serve also for the honey barrels not a few however but many thousands of these vessels will be required they must therefore be placed close together as well for economy of space as for natural warmth the cells could be grouped together mouth upwards in horizontal planes story above story but such a method of construction would be economically unsound to prevent sagging in the heat of the hive and under the weight they will be called to bear the cell bases would have to be thickened collectively into a substantial floor which would need shoring up at intervals after the manner of the wasps but in this much valuable material would be diverted from its proper use obviously a better plan would be to lay all the cells on their sides and pile them up into a vertical wall and just as obviously is two walls of these superimposed cells were placed back to back so that one central vertical sheet of wax would serve to stop the ends of all the cells right and left a saving of half the material used for the cell bottoms would at once be effected but so far the design is still only in its crude initial stage the upright comb consisting of a double pile of round cells back to back with one flat base between although a great advance on the single sheet of horizontal cells is yet mechanically and economically deficient the round cells leave useless interstices which take much wax in the filling while the flat bottoms do not coincide with the form of the larvae and thus still more space is wasted clearly improvement can only come by altering the shape of the cell and now the bee seems to have asked itself and triumphantly answered an extremely complex question she knew how much internal cell space each larva required for growth the problem therefore was this of what shape nearly approaching the cylindrical ought such a cell to be made which would ensure the right dimensions but which would occupy the least possible room have the greatest possible strength consume the least possible material in its manufacture and possess the property that a number of similar cells could be built up in a double vertical plane leaving no interstices either between the cells or between the planes there is only one solution to this problem and the honey-bee found it who shall say how many ages ago in the hexagon cell with its base composed of three roms the whole astounding ingenuity of the thing can only be realized when a piece of nearly perfect new-made virgin comb has been closely examined it will be at once seen that the hexagon cells combine together over the surface of the comb in absolute geometrical union and that the six-sided form is round enough for all practical purposes looking into the cells on one side of the comb it will be noted that their bases take the form of depressed pyramids each made up of three diamond-shaped planes turning the comb over we see that the cells on this side 
also have pyramidal bottoms. If the depth of a cell on one side of the comb be taken, and added to the depth of a cell on the other side, and then the width of the whole comb be measured, it will be found that the combined depth of the two cells perceptibly exceeds the width of the whole comb. At first glance, this seems like a case of the less including the greater, which is a manifest impossibility. But, holding the comb up to the light, a further discovery is made, and the seeming paradox is eliminated. The bottoms of the cells are so thin as to be almost transparent, and it is at once seen that the cells are not built end to end in line, but that each cell base on one side of the comb covers part of three cell bases on the other. If the three diamonds, composing between them the triangular base of a single cell, be perforated with a needle, and the comb turned over, it will be found that the three perforations come each in a separate cell. Thus the saving in the total width of the comb is effected by allowing the pyramidal bases on each side to engage alternately like the teeth of a trap. Instead of meeting point blank, they overlap each other, and the faces of the pyramids are so contrived that each of them helps to close two cells. There is another advantage in this arrangement, which will be immediately obvious. The apex and three ribs of each pyramidal cell base form foundation lines for the cell walls on the other side of the comb. This means that not only do all cell walls abut on an arch, but that every cell base is strengthened throughout by a triple girdering. The result is that the amount of wax required in the construction of the comb can be everywhere reduced to an absolute minimum. It becomes merely a question of what thickness of wax will retain the honey and this experience proves to be no more than 180th part of an inch. The whole thing, indeed, might very well be taken as an ideal exemplar of the triumph of mind over matter. The geometric principles brought into play in the construction of honeycomb have been a favourite study with mathematicians of all ages, and especially this rhombiform method adopted by the bee in flooring her cells. The rhomb is best described as a plain figure whose four sides are equal, like those of a square, but whose angles are not right angles. In such a figure there are necessarily two greater angles and two smaller, facing each other in pairs. The three rhombs, composing the base of the honey cell, lean together, as has been seen in the form of a blunt pyramid, and, treating all angles as negligible factors, the bluntness of this pyramid is found to coincide very aptly with the shape of the full-grown larvae. But this is not the only reason for the particular inclination given by the bee to the rhombs forming the base of each cell. Economy rules here, as in everything else she undertakes, and the truth that she has chosen the one and only form of cell base which takes the least possible material to construct has received very striking confirmation. The story is an old and famous one, but it will bear repeating. A great naturalist once put himself to an infinity of trouble in measuring the angles formed by the rhombs in a vast number of comb cell bases, and he found that these showed remarkable uniformity. 
it will be clear that the hollow pyramid of the cell bottom will be either deep or shallow according to the shape of the three roms composing it the apex of the pyramid is formed by the meeting of three equal angles one from each romb and it is plain that this apex will be sharp or blunt according to whether the meeting angles are wide or narrow it was of course impossible to ascertain the dimensions of these angles with absolutely microscopical nicety but dealing only with the most perfect comb the naturalist found that the two greater angles in the roms measured very nearly one hundred and ten degrees and the two lesser angles seventy degrees he also found that the angles formed by the conjunction of the cell sides with the bases had the same dimensions as those of the roms assuming therefore that mathematically the angles of the roms and the cell sides should be equal he was able to calculate exactly the angles for which the bees were evidently striving in the construction of the roms 109 degrees 28 minutes and 70 degrees 32 minutes another bee lover scientist ruminating over these figures was much impressed by them and determined to find out the reason why the bee made such constant choice of this particular shape of romb he therefore conceived the idea of submitting the bee's judgment on this cell-based question to an independent authority without disclosing his object he propounded the following problem to one of the greatest mathematicians of the day supposing said he in effect you were required to close the end of an hexagonal vessel by three rhombs or diamond-shaped plates what angles must be given to these rhombs so that the greatest amount of space would be enclosed by the least amount of material it was a difficult problem but the mathematician worked it out at last and his answer was 109 degrees 26 minutes and 70 degrees 34 minutes now the difference between the calculation of the man and the calculation of the bee was an exceedingly small one no one thought of calling into question the work of the man who was pre-eminent in his world of figures it was therefore accepted as a fact that the bee had made a trifling mistake so trifling however that in the matter of comb building it was of no importance her reputation was unimpaired to all intents and purposes the honey cell was still a perfect example of utmost capacity secured by least material but another mathematician a scotsman this time went over the whole business again and he proved conclusively that the bee was right while the first mathematician was wrong he showed that the true answer to the problem of the angles was 109 degrees 28 minutes and 70 degrees 32 minutes identically the figures obtained by estimation of the honeycomb in the foregoing pages the principles involved in the construction of honeycomb have been gone into rather minutely because it is here that the lines of thought between the old and the new naturalists seem to make a typical divergence both schools are in the main agreed on the point that all forms of life emanate from the one omnipotent source and it matters little whether we speak of the vast periods of time during which the creation of all things was effected as ages or under the old biblical metaphor of days 
but whereas the old school appears to insist on different qualities of life immortal soul in man and a mystic subconscious perishable thing called instinct in the brute creation the new school is unable to see any distinction between the intellectual equipment of man and brute but that of degree between the honey-bee and her masters there is indeed a great gulf fixed but it is conceivably not unbridgeable and unless we are determined at all cost of logical violence to force a favourite set of square opinions into the round holes of observed fact it is difficult to see how the old position is long to remain tenable with regard to this particular question of comb building an attempt is still being made to show that it is entirely due to the working of certain natural laws and is independent of any intelligence or volition which the bees are supposed to exercise we are told that the cells are always begun in a circular form but that they afterwards assume the hexagon shape quite automatically in obedience to the laws of mutual interference and pressure as a proof of this it is pointed out that the outside cells of the comb not being subject to these laws are usually more or less rounded the pressure theory is hardly worth serious consideration as it is obvious that the growth of a honeycomb is perfectly free and untrammelled in every way if the bee makes her comb cells with six sides and a pyramidal base unthinkingly and under the yoke of imperious obligation it is certainly not because the cells force this shape upon one another like buffon's peas in a bottle and if we believe that the bee works blindly under the law of mutual interference any close examination of the results of her work must bring us to the conviction that we are only putting aside one marvel for something more wonderful still for then we see a natural law taking on a very unnatural quality that of intelligent adaptation to circumstances the comb intended for use in the hive nursery is made in two sizes that used for cradling the worker brood has cells measuring one-fifth of an inch across and a fraction less than half an inch deep while that designed for raising the drone larvae is built up of cells having a diameter of one quarter of an inch and a depth of about five eighths of an inch these different sized cells are not mingled indiscriminately over the comb but are grouped together in large blocks some of the combs will be entirely composed of worker cells which are always in the vast majority other combs will be made up of both kinds the bees begin a comb by attaching a small block of wax to the roof of the hive on either side of this they hollow out depressions which become the bases of the first cells the work is then extended downwards and sideways the cell bases being multiplied in all directions as fast as possible so that there are a great number of unfinished cells in progress long before the walls of the first cells have been completed there is a very reasonable motive for this procedure when a house is being built as much of the foundations as possible are laid in at the commencement to allow a large body of bricklayers to get to work on the walls at the same time and the bee extends her comb foundations on the same principle when about half the comb has been finished for worker brood 
it may be decided to commence building drone cells. As the bases of the drone cells are larger than those of the worker cells, it follows that a change must be effected in the ground plan of the comb. The bees prepare for this transition very cleverly, evidently studying how the regularity of the comb may be least interrupted. Sometimes the change is contrived without any appreciable loss of space, but more often several misshapen cells have to be made before the symmetrical progress of the comb is resumed. This depends largely on the inherited skill of the bees, which varies according to their strain, as all experienced beekeepers know. Now, if the work of comb building is carried through by the bees under blind compulsion of the natural laws of mutual interference and pressure, what other law, it may be asked, interferes with these in turn when the transition from one size of cell to another must be made? If it is all a sort of crystallization going on independently of the bee's will or wish, it appears more than curious that the mill should grind large or small, just as the needs of the hive demand it. But the whole position is really little else than a flagrant example of the evils of argument from a simile. Soaked peas in a bottle will swell to hexagons, or rather, dodecahedrons, by the law of mutual interference. Soap bubbles will do the same, with no more constriction than their own weight. But peas and bubbles are things self-contained and separately existing, before being brought together. If the bees made a vast number of separate round cells and then combined them simultaneously, no doubt all but the outside cells would assume the hexagon form. But the essence of the whole art and ingenuity of comb building lies in the fact that there is no such thing as a separate cell. Each single compartment in the comb shares its parts with no less than nine other compartments, and to talk of mutual interference when there is no separate existence is ploughing the sands indeed. There are other circumstances connected with the work of the comb builders, which go far to confirm the position that bees do exercise reason, and that of a high order. It has been said that the interior of a hive in daytime is not altogether deprived of light. Probably, during the hours of greatest activity, the bees have always enough light to see their way about by means of their wonderful indoor eyes, which, under the microscope, have all the solemn wisdom of an owl's. It is a fact, however, that comb building is usually carried on at night time, when other employments are in temporary abeyance. Possibly the, to our eyes, profoundest darkness may be no darkness at all to the bees. But to all appearances, as we can judge of them, honeycomb is virtually made in the dark. But combs are built side by side, often simultaneously. They grow downwards together, yet always preserve their right distance apart, so that, when finished, there will be an intervening gangway between the sealed surfaces of about a quarter of an inch, which is just enough to allow the two streams of bees to pass each other back to back. How are these distances preserved, seeing that the bees at work on the bottom edge of each comb are separated by a space of, perhaps, an inch and a half of empty darkness? 
a simple experiment will at once give a clue to this if a hive in which a swarm has constructed about half its depth of comb be cantered a little sideways so as to throw the combs out of the perpendicular and the hive be then left for several days it will be found on examination that all building from the moment of disturbance has followed on the new line of verticality the combs will all be slightly bent to one side this means either that the bees have a natural sense of the perpendicular or that they work by the plumb line as humanity is constrained to do the fact seems to be that the hanging cluster of wax-making bees performs the office of a living plummet and really guides the comb in its downward progress yet do bees always suspend their combs do they never construct a waxen storehouse raising it tier above tier from the floor of the hive after the system of the more intelligent creature man the first commentary on this is that such a departure from their common methods would be no improvement but a retrograde step these long comb walls of the bees have a close analogy to the modern transatlantic skyscraper building the trouble with all such buildings is to provide them with sufficient base for their height if american engineers had at their disposal a material of adequate tensile strength and there were anything in nature to hang them from it would be scientifically a better plan to suspend these buildings than to erect them because the house would then naturally tend to keep its verticality and the base problem would cease to exist on the same principle the bees having at hand a material of almost ideal tensility and a suitable hanging beam wisely suspend their heavily weighted combs from the roof instead of erecting them like certain kinds of ant structures but it is undoubtedly long racial experience and not inability to follow the humanly approved method that guides them here rarely so rarely that the writer in the course of many years spent among bees has seen only three examples of it bees will build comb upwards if circumstances will allow no other way and this would seem not only to drive the last coffin nail for the poor instinct theory but to carve its epitaph as well in one of the instances referred to a glass bottom box had been inverted over the feed hole of a common hive and had there remained forgotten as the season progressed the hive grew great with bees and honey and it became imperative to build additional store comb in the box overhead but its slippery glass roof would give no foothold to the builders time and again they must have tried to get upon it with their wax hods filled and ready and each time failed the ordinary way of comb building was clearly impossible then the engineers of the hive inspired by the difficulty got to work in another way on the wooden surface below they laid out the plan of a garner house not after their usual method of parallel combs but a regular oblong house with cellular storerooms and communicating passages in between upon this they raised story above story of horizontal cells until the glass roof was nearly reached at this stage apparently the honey flow came to an end in the fields for the cells in the storehouse were never sealed though all were nearly full of honey and later in the season it was found and carried away by the bee-master 
who still preserves it as a curiosity he bears a well-known name that of dr herbert macdonald philpotts of kingswear devon and his testimony as to the making of this unique little honey-house is beyond question but indeed it carries in itself infallible evidence of its authenticity all honey cells made by bees have a slight upward inclination which helps as has already been explained to retain their contents until they can be capped over and every cell in the storehouse clearly showed this upward slant end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the law of the honey bee by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain where the bee sucks it is characteristic of those unlettered in bee craft that they are often afraid when there is no danger and will venture with the intrepidity that is born of ignorance where old experienced beekeepers fear to tread temper in bees is one of the most variable qualities in a creature made up of variabilities there are times when a summer storm is threatening and the air is charged with electricity when to go among the bees is to court certain disaster and there are other times such as the full height of the honey flow when almost any liberties can be taken with bees without fear of reprisals and yet this is not always the rule much depends on their lineage and the purity of the strain and again on the systems of the bee master bees respond as readily as any other form of domestic stock to wise and considerate treatment handled in a firm quiet deliberate way the most vicious colony can often be dealt with in perfect safety while the mildest natured bees will commonly meet fumbling indexterity with a prompt challenge to war since the italian bee was brought to england some half century ago there is no doubt that the original english strain has been greatly modified some authorities indeed question whether there are any absolutely pure british bees left at all the golden girdles of the italian crop up in the most unlikely places and the foreign blood seems to have got into the race in all but the remotest parts of the country one must regret although it is a vain regret now that these undesirable aliens were ever allowed to set foot on the soil whatever naturally survives and thrives in a particular country must be the most suitable thing for that country and these southern races of the honey-bee seem to have brought back to the detriment of our own stock idiosyncrasies long ago bred out of the native race much of the nervous irritability and proneness to disease visible in the honey-bee of to-day is more or less directly traceable to the introduction of foreign blood and the grand special advantage of the italian bee its much vaunted and widely advertised possession of a long tongue has proved an entire myth numberless measurements undertaken by our leading scientific apiarians have proved that the italian bee has a tongue no longer than any other although most are willing to concede her the possession of a very long and ready sting indeed but here we do her an injustice a pure-bred italian worker bee is as good or as bad-tempered as any other of her species 
it is the first crosses with the native bee which display so much vindictive aggressiveness and have given to the whole race its general bad name in the time of the great honey flow which in southern england begins in may early or late according to the season and may endure for six weeks it is a common thing in the country to see people turn back from the footpaths running through the white clover or sainfoin fields because of the huge and terrifying uproar made by the foraging bees when there is a large acreage under these crops and the day is a fair one this note reaches a volume hardly to be credited as a sound of work and peace it is much more like the din of a great bee war and it is small wonder that the stranger unlearned in the ways of the hives should fear to go through what is very like a scene of battle and carnage and yet there is no time of year when the honey-bee is so little inclined to molest her human fellow-creatures as this so long as the honey weather holds the warm nights when the nectar is secreted and the rainless days when it can be gathered she can hardly be induced to attack even if her home is being turned inside out and the sudden sunlight riddling its darkness through and through until within comparatively recent years it was universally believed that honey was a pure untouched secretion from the flowers and that beyond gathering and storing it the bee had no part in its production this idea however is a wholly mistaken one honey is a manufactured article and differs in almost every way from the raw juices obtained from the various flower crops the nectar of flowers before collection by the bee seems to have hardly any of the constituents of ripe honey three quarters of its bulk consists of plain water in which about twenty per cent of cane sugar is dissolved the rest being made up of essential oils and gums which give it its distinctive flavour but mature honey contains very little water certainly never more than a sixth part of its bulk its sugar is almost entirely grape sugar it is decidedly acid while the nectar is always neutral and the oils and aromatic principles of the flower juices are matured and developed into the well-known honey flavour which is like nothing else in the world it is certain that the process of manufacture begins directly the bee draws the nectar from the flower cup as the liquid passes into the honey sac it is mingled with the acid secretion from the gland at the base of the tongue when the bee reaches the hive she does not pour her burden direct into the cells but passes it on to one of the house bees who conveys it to the honey vats it is even probable that the nectar is transferred a second time before it reaches the cell although this point is still undecided the effect of such transference is to add more acid properties to the original juice the honey seems to undergo a regular brewing process within the hive it is kept at a temperature of about eighty degrees or eighty five degrees and it is then that the surplus water passes off into vapour in this way the raw nectar loses at least two-thirds of its natural bulk before it is finally converted into honey it is said that at the last moment just before each cell is stopped with an impervious covering of wax the bee turns herself about and injects into the honey a drop of the poison from her sting 
but there seems to be not the slightest evidence in support of this the contents of the poison sack are it is true mainly formic acid which is a strong preservative and undoubtedly traces of formic acid are to be found in all honeys it has been however conclusively proved that this acid finds its way into the honey from the glandular system of the bee and not through its sting the industry of the bee in nectar gathering has always been a stock subject for wonder and it is commonly supposed that she is born with full instinctive capabilities for her task a little observation however soon tends to upset this theory the work of foraging has to be learnt step by step like every other species of skilled work in hive life the young bee setting out on her first flight has all the will to do well and her imitative faculty is strongly developed but she seems to have very little else her first experiences are a succession of blunders she appears not to know for certain where to look for the coveted sweets and can be seen industriously searching the most unlikely places crevices in walls tufts of grass or the leaves of a plant instead of its flowers the fact that the nectar is hidden deep down in the cup of the flower beyond its pollen-bearing mechanism seems to dawn upon her only after much thought and many fruitless essays it has been proved that bees will go as far as two or even three miles in their foraging journeys the distance seems to vary according to the nature of the country bees in hilly districts appear to venture only short distances from home while in flat country the foraging flights are more extended a bee line has become proverbial for a straight course but it is doubtful whether the bee ever makes a perfectly direct flight from point to point the truth seems to be that there are well-defined air paths out from and home to every bee garden and that these are continually thronged with bees going and returning throughout the working hours of the day these aerial thoroughfares lie high above all but the tallest obstacles so high indeed that the keenest sight will reveal nothing only the busy song of the travellers can be heard like a river of music far overhead in the south down country where the isolated farms are each surrounded with their compact acreage of blossoming sheep feed and there is nothing but empty miles of close cropped turf between these bee roads in the air can be easily found and studied walking over the springy undulating grass in the quiet of a summer's morning a faint far-off note breaks suddenly upon you like the twang of a harp-string high up in the blue a step or two onward and you lose it retracing your path it peals out again you can see nothing strain your eyes as you will but its cause is evident and with a little trying you can presently make out the main direction of the flight and see down in the hollow far below the huddled roofs of a farmstead with a patchwork of fields about it white with clover or rose red with sainfoin in fullest bloom perhaps there is no honey in the world so fine as that to be obtained from these solitary downland settlements with the ordinary consumer honey is merely honey and there is an end of the matter but the bee-man knows that the quality of honey varies as greatly as that of wine 
he will tell you at first taste the crop from which it is gathered whether it has one source or many whether it is all flower essence or has been contaminated by the hateful honeydew which is not honey at all down in the lowlands except at certain rare seasons when only one crop is in flower it is next to impossible to get honey absolutely from a single source but here on the hills the bees are not tempted by glowing gardens with their feeble washy sweets nor are they led aside by the coarse-natured privet or horse chestnut or sunflower there is only one trencher to their banquet but this is a vast illimitable one they have nothing to do but to wend out and home all day long between the hives and a single field it is difficult to gauge with anything like approximate truth the amount of honey that one flowering crop will yield but probably when all conditions are most favourable every acre of dutch clover will produce about five pounds of pure honey for each day it is left standing in full bloom the nectar is obviously secreted by the flower as an attraction to the bee who blundering into it with her pollen smothered body unconsciously affects its fertilization directly this object is gained the flow of nectar in each particular floret appears to cease and the bee passes it by the student of old books on apiculture is often surprised to read so much in praise of honeydew while in the modern bee garden he hears of it nothing but hearty condemnation he is told that directly the bees begin to gather honeydew the store racks must be removed from the hives or the good honey will be ruined both in colour and flavour he is shown some dark ill-looking watery stuff carefully sealed up by the bees and is informed that it is nearly all honeydew but he asks himself can this be the same thing about which the old masters were led into such ardent eulogy the truth is that when ancient and medieval writers spoke of honeydew they used the word as a general term for all that the bees gathered honey was all a dew divinely rained down from the skies and it is entirely of a piece with the all but universal lack of bee knowledge down almost to the beginning of the nineteenth century that so few should have guessed that the flowers themselves had anything to do with the matter virgil and the rest of the classics held absolute sway over all minds pretending to the least culture and even the naturalists seem to have studied the wild life around them with no other object than to force facts into line with ancient poetic fantasies the old writers explained the varying qualities of honey as being due to the influence of whatever stars happen to be in the ascendant at the time of its gathering and the honey was good or bad according to whether this was favourable or unfavourable the quality and consistency of honey varies extraordinarily as between the different sources of true nectar but there is no doubt that honeydew well merits the evil name it has gained with modern beekeepers there are perhaps three hundred distinct kinds of aphides known to english naturalists and all these eject the sweet liquid which under certain conditions bees are tempted to gather this honeydew varies in flavour according to the species of tree from whose sap it is derived probably much of it is only a sweet slightly mawkish liquor which in its pure state 
combines with the genuine honey without causing noticeable deterioration at least to the unexpert taste and eye but unfortunately for beekeepers the oak is a great favourite with these parasites no fewer than six varieties preying on this one tree alone and oak honeydew is a pestilent thing indeed it is commonly supposed that the first cold nights that mark the beginning of the end of the honey season stimulate the production of honeydew for it is after a chilly night that bees are usually seen at work on the trees where the aphides abound a much more likely theory however is that the cold does not accelerate the secretion of the honeydew but cuts off the more legitimate resources of the hive just when they are in fullest activity and so the huge armies of foragers are momentarily thrown out of work and must seek new outlets for their energy the secretion of true nectar takes place mainly at night and requires a temperature of about seventy degrees anything much lower than this means dearth on the morrow no matter how fine and warm the weather may then prove the dark colour of aphis syrup a very little of which will ruin for market the finest honey seems to be due as much to foreign matter as to its natural evil character there is a peculiar growth on the bark of many trees where aphides congregate which is known as soot fungus this and the honeydew get mingled together in a cimmerian slime and no doubt the merest trace of it would serve to darken and spoil the purest honey there seems to be no way for beekeepers but to watch for the first chilly nights as the honey season draws towards its close and then to be up early and get the surplus honey chambers off the hives before the bees have had a chance to spoil them but the bee is no desperately early riser for all her lofty place in the moral maxim books she generally waits until the morning sun has drunk up the night dews and warmed the flower calluses before getting down to her work in earnest the very early bees that may sometimes be seen winging out into the first light of a summer's morning are probably only water carriers the water supply is the day's first and last care with each hive in the breeding season every bee garden seems to have its regular watering place generally on the oozy margin of some neighbouring pond and here in the early morning and again towards late afternoon the bees may be seen drinking in whole battalions while the meridian hours of the day will find it all but deserted curiously these water-fetching times coincide with the times when the nectar is least get atable or when the supply is exhausted for the day which is another sidelight on honey bee economics to follow the bees through their honey harvesting season is to review nearly the whole year's natural growth and life in southern england the earliest nectar is drawn from the willows which come into flower with late march but hold back their sweets until the first space of fine hot weather comes flooding in the track of the chilly northern gales of willow honey there may be much or little according to the night temperatures generally it goes by fits and starts for a day or two here and there the trees may be crowded with bees or they may be deserted for weeks together whenever the sun shines indeed 
the trees that stand up like torches of gold in the misty purple of budding woods are always full of the singing multitude but these are only the pollen gatherers the nectar bearing willows are far less showy their catkins are small tight girt tassels of green and when a warm night has brought them into profit they attract all the noisy minstrels for miles around beekeepers generally seem to leave the willows out of their calculations as a source of honey but in riverside districts and in favourable seasons they are not to be overlooked it sometimes happens that april comes in with a succession of mild sunny days and warm nights and then the hives may suddenly overflow with willow honey when the yellow catkins fade out of sight the willows are apt to fade out of memory and it does not seem to be commonly known that the female catkins continue to secrete abundant nectar often up to the end of may good honey years are scarce under the changing english skies yet nature's design for the hive people is obviously to give an unbroken succession of honey yielding plants throughout the whole spring and summer and pollen whenever a bright break of sunshine may lure them out of doors the white clover is seldom ready until the first week in june but from the earliest willows in march until the last of the flowering seed crops is down in late july there is abundance of provender if only the fickle sun will do its part in the matter the clover as farming goes nowadays is a great main source of honey in southern england at least but the connoisseurs are at variance as to what yields the absolute perfection of honey scotsmen are all of one mind for a rare chance in this and will hear nothing but the heather carefully discriminating between the bell heather which is good and the ling heather which is immeasurably better yet there is a honey or rather a honey blend which far outstrips them all though it is as rare and almost as priceless as the once famous comet vintages it is to be had only when the apple blossom and the hawthorn come into full flower together and this is only when a chill april has delayed the one and a summer like may has forced on the other then to the mellow refinement of the apple nectar is added the delicate almond flavour of the hawthorn and the resulting honey is easily the finest sweetmeat in the world wonder is often expressed that one of the most generally cultivated crops the red clover is seldom visited by the honey bee although the bumblebees fill it with their deep trombone music at all times of the day it is true that the tongue of the hive bee cannot reach to the bottom of the long red clover calyx but this would not deter her if the nectar were worth the gathering she would cut through the petal at its base as she does with many other flowers and so steal an effective march on her better caparisoned rival but red clover nectar is poor in consistency and coarse of flavour when the main crop is in flower it would yield a practically unlimited amount of honey but this is just the time when the bee can employ herself more profitably elsewhere after the red clover has been cut a second growth springs up bearing flower tubes less developed and therefore shorter than those of the first crop but now other and better sources of supply are rapidly failing the bee for whom in prosperous times nothing but the best is good enough must revise her taste to meet her necessities 
at this time she is as busy as the rest in the red clover fields and when her clearer sweeter note is heard there mingling its contralto with the hoarser music of the bumblebee it is a token that the heyday of the year is past the honey chambers must be taken off the hives without delay End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of the law of the honey bee by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the drone and his story it is true that all bee-keepers are enthusiasts and true that long years spent in the companionship of the hives invariably create a fearless fellowship a prime understanding between the bee master and his legions but it is equally true that the longer you study the nature of the honey bee the less enamoured you become of certain of her ways in the minds of old bee men there grows up as the years glide a sort of awe of her she is so manifestly a power supreme in her little world she is so courageous resourceful brainy all the weaknesses and compromises and most of the pleasures have long ago been driven out of her life seemingly by her own act and will yet in doing this she has but refined the science of citizenship to its pure elements her entire unselfishness her readiness to sacrifice her individual good for the good of the state are as unquestionable as they are changeless the hive polity taken as a whole is so admirable and compares so advantageously with certain human efforts in the same way that you are apt to exalt all her qualities into virtues and to conclude that a far-seeing wise benevolence must have gone to the making of the perfect bee-state instead of the cold undeviating logic that alone has fashioned it this remorseless melting down of life into the set moulds of principle without mercy and without reproach has a cumulative effect on the mind of the observer and sooner or later though he will early lose his fear of her sting he will develop a very real but vague awe of the honey-bee in another way just as moses rusden the king's bee-master held up the life of the hive as nature's evidence of the divine will in earthly monarchy so the latter-day student is often constrained to ask himself whether the bee commonwealth does not point an authoritative moral in another way here is a state only a mimic one but still not a negligible example where several of the most fiercely debated questions of modern human life are seen in long adopted and perfected working order and seen in their fullness of result any attempt at a serious comparison between men and women and the drone and worker bee would justly lay the writer open to the charge of grotesque trifling but there is more than a fanciful analogy between the principles on which all civilizations must be based whether they are insect or human it cannot be denied that the communal life of the honey-bee is a high civilization that it has grown to be what it is to-day through ages of necessity that the one sex has the other under a complete and terrible subjection for which and for the privilege of all power the dominant sex has paid a terrible price the worker-bee to-day is an over-intellectual, neurotic, 
morbidly dutiful creature, while the drone is admittedly nothing but a stupid, happy, sensual lout. If the extreme difference between the sexes in bee life had been aboriginal, the relations of drone and worker, as we see them in the hives today, would be meet and reasonable enough. But there seems to be clear evidence that, far back in the life of the race, the female bee was not so hopelessly superior to her mate. The queen bee, in all likelihood, fairly represents the mother bee as she was before the cooling crust of the earth made some sort of protected habitation necessary, which led first to close clustering for mutual warmth, and then gradually developed the complicated hive life of today. But evolution will hardly account for all that we see. Revolution must have had its part in the production of the modern self-unsexed worker. It has been seen that there is no physiological reason why each worker in the hive should not have grown into the fertile mother of thousands. The workers are not a stunted, specialised race, slowly evolved by time and necessity, and procreating their own stunted kind. But each worker is deliberately manufactured to a set pattern by the authorities in the hive, obedient to the call of the state. And when did the female bees begin this tampering with the springs of life, this improving upon creation, which was the first vital step, failing which the present bee commonwealth had been impossible? It looks very like a superb act of generalship, in the great primeval war of sex, a brilliant piece of strategy that gave victory at a blow, and rendered the after steps in the scheme of conquest a matter of logical sequence. The whole question of the artificial production of the worker bee is surrounded with difficulties, and it seems possible, on our present level of knowledge, to do little more than state the facts, and there leave them. The supremacy of the females in hive life appears to have dated from the time that the vast majority deprived themselves, or were deprived by their immediate ancestors, of their share in procreation, and the ovipositor discovered itself as a weapon of offence and defence. Before the worker bees existed as an armed force, there is no reason to suppose that the female bee had a great physical advantage over the drone. The queen bee's propensity to thrust her ovipositor into the spiracles of her rival, and so effectually to dispatch her, as well as her inveterate hatred of her kind, may both be late developments due to the isolated, artificial life she now leads. While the worker is ever ready with her sting, the queen uses it so rarely that many old experienced beekeepers of the present time deny her altogether the power of stinging. A much more natural tendency with her is to bite and when it comes to the use of the sharp, strong, sidelong jaws, the drone has a more redoubtable equipment than any, although he has apparently lost the will and sense to use it. Whatever the drone may have been in far-off ages, the worker bees have him now well under the iron heel of matriarchal expediency, and they see to it that he shall be fit only for the one indispensable office, although in that regard they exhaust every ingenuity to make him all that his kind should be. It is plain they would do without him altogether if that were possible. As it is, for nine months in the year, 
there are no drones at all and then only a few hundreds are raised in each hive the bare minimum that will ensure the successful mating of the young queens when the summer sunshine calls them to their wooing it might be supposed that where there are comparatively so few queens to be fertilized only two or three at most from each hive and these only once in a lifetime that even those drones which are now tolerated are in excess of the number required but a cardinal principle in bee life is that the young queens shall choose their mates from another tribe and so ensure a continual influx of new blood to the colony this can only be effected out of doors and as far as possible from the parent hive the strongest impulse therefore of the virgin queen when she goes off on her mating flight is to get away quickly from her home surroundings she flies straight off at tremendous speed and thus has every chance of getting unperceived into new country and so into the reconnoitring ground of strange drones another reason for her extended flight and its remarkable pace is that only the strongest and swiftest drone of all the pursuing multitude is likely to overtake her and this again makes for the betterment of the race perhaps there is no parallel instance in nature where the selection of the fittest individuals to continue a species is so carefully provided for and no doubt this accounts for the high place of the honey-bee in the scale of created things but this scheme involves enormous risk to the young queen a hundred dangers lurk on her path she is a tempting morsel for every bird that throngs the air of the june morning her untried wings may fail her even if she gets back safely to the bee garden she may enter the wrong hive to her instant destruction but she must take her chance of all risks and the only thing to do is to render her absence from home as brief as may be and her fertilization as sure by making the wandering drone population large enough to cover all probable ranges of flight from the very first the drone is nurtured in a different way from the worker bee the egg is laid in a wider and deeper cell and during its first three days of life the drone larva is fed with bee milk probably of a special kind and certainly of more generous quantity after the third day this chyle food is reduced as is the case with the worker grub but while the worker is then given only honey it is certain that the drone larva receives both honey and pollen and that for a full day longer in all it takes about twenty-four or twenty-five days to produce the perfect drone bee as against an average twenty-one days for the worker the queen bee as has been already seen is developed in much less time than either little more than a fortnight elapsing between the time the egg is laid and the time she is ready to gnaw her way out of the cell after the drone is hatched it will be another two weeks or so before he makes his first venture in the open air all this time he has the free run of the larder and steadily gorges himself on honey when he is not sleeping off the effects of his surfeit in some snug out-of-the-way corner of the hive but honey is not his only or even his principal food throughout his whole life he is constantly fed by the house bees with the rich chyle food given to him as a larva and it has been proved 
that if this is withheld from him for the space of three days he will die of starvation even in the midst of abundant honey thus the worker bees have him completely in their power the first flight of the drones is a stirring event in the bee garden the common sound of the hives goes on practically the whole year through every sunny midday when the temperature mounts to forty five degrees or fifty degrees will see each hive the centre of a little galaxy of singers it is only the volume of the music that varies with the waxing or waning days but with the coming of the drones the whole symphony of the bee garden abruptly changes they never move from their snug indoor quarters until the day is wearing on towards noon and then only in the brightest weather blundering aggressively through the crowd of busy foragers they rise heavily on the wing and soon the ordinary note of the garden is drowned in the new uproar they seem to come almost simultaneously from all hives at once for a minute or two the rich hoarse melody holds the air and then almost as suddenly it dies away as these roistering ne'er-do-wells troop off over hill and dale each to his favourite hunting ground there is a great divergence of opinion as to the limits of flight of the drone but probably he goes farther and faster than any have yet credited his magnificent stretch and strength of wing mark him for a flyer he is all brute force and lusty energy and it would be strange if with but one thing to do in life to gad about in search of amorous adventure he could not do it to a purpose if a hive of bees be removed to a distance in the height of the season some of both workers and drones are sure to find their way back to the old spot this has constantly taken place when hives have been carried no farther than two miles but in one case when the distance was more than twice as much no workers were seen round the old hive station yet a little company of drones was winging aimlessly about the tenantless stall and there can be little doubt that these belong to the removed colony it is not suggested that they deliberately travelled all these miles the chances are that in their daily flight they got so far away from the new station that they came within the zone of old landmarks and thus naturally went on by the long accustomed ways as a typical instance of a sluggard and idler the drone bee has enjoyed a vogue in the preparatory school books for ages past but whatever his primeval equipment for usefulness may have been it is evident now that he could not labour if he would physically in all points but that of muscle as well as mentally he has become degraded to the inferior of the worker bee in every way he is destitute of all those special contrivances with which she is so amply furnished he has no baskets for pollen carrying nor any of the ingenious brushes and combs which she uses to scrape the pollen from herself and others he has neither wax generating organs nor leg pincers to deal with wax his tongue is too short for honey getting his brain is much smaller than even that of the feeble-minded queen the intricate gland systems which play so important a role in the daily life of the worker are either completely atrophied in the drone or exist only in an elementary state while it has been the communal will of the hive that the worker bee should develop 
an amazing proficiency of mind and body the same forces have been steadily at work to degrade the male bee into a creature of dependence gradually training out of him all initiative and idea except in the one direction just as in the case of the queen and the worker drone and worker bee seem hardly to belong to the same race and yet for all his frank incapabilities and lack of ideals the drone offers in one respect a refreshing contrast to his sour stern duty worshipping sister he is a lifelong incorrigible optimist he fiddles gaily while the city burns. All his misery and mourning would not serve to quench a single spark of it. So he eats, drinks, and is merry, with the intuition of all drones that Nemesis waits on the morrow with something disagreeable. It is impossible to study his ways for long, without recognising the spirit of rude jollity and horseplay that thoroughly pervades all he does in and out of the hive he blusters cannoning roughly against all he meets and raising his burly bullying song in the air as a sort of protest against all this anxious industry going on about him once gone from the neighbourhood of the hive he seems to keep incessantly on the wing until hunger prompts him home again for no one has ever seen a drone bee among the insects that haunt the flowers nor ever seen him basking on a sunlit wall or tree trunk after the kind of almost every other winged atom in the universe he comes back to the hive with the same noisy careless fanfaronade and is received by the workers with the same sullen indifference they give him his fill of bee milk linking tongues with him as he sits up like an overgrown baby voracious clamouring to be fed they suffer him to swill at the honey stores unchecked but plainly regard him with contumely he is a terrible expense to the state yet a necessary one silently they go about their uncongenial business of nourishing him silently and with an ominous patience they grudge him every drop and all the more urge him to his excesses it is not for long the day of reckoning is near at hand already the poppies glow scarlet on the hill the poppies that mark the turning point of the summer and after them the long decline with its ever diminishing sun glow each day with a scantier mead of blossom until the path runs again into the dreary levels the sober greys and russets of winter death now the worker bee is to show a grisly seam in her nature matching ill with the fine hues and qualities of mind for which she is so justly famed and that she is not all lovable all admirable accounts for the exceeding love of her that moves the hearts of men who know her through and through the story of the massacre of the drones has hardly a parallel for sheer relentless ferocity unrecking abandonment to a vengeance long withheld for expediency's sake there come the first chill nights of mid-july and the honey flow is suddenly at an end the clover and sainfoin have already fallen to the sickle nothing but the bravest warmth and exuberance of the summer could now withstand the drain of the myriad honey-makers and a few hours cold dams up at once the attenuated stream the time of prosperity is over there will be no more abundance of honey 
it remains for the genius of hive economy to prove how much of what has been gathered can be preserved for future needs the first sign of the debacle is the throwing out at the hive entrance of certain pale gruesome objects the corpses of immature drones not dead from mischance but ruthlessly torn from their cells this may go on intermittently for many days and while the fell work is proceeding the living drones seem to take no warning they keep up their merry round the unending feast riots forward daily the bee garden is filled with their careless overweening song and then at last the signal for the slaughter is given within each hive a curious sobbing outcry begins a cry that is nothing but sheer terror put into sound the drones no longer lie in easy ranks between the combs placidly sleeping off one debauch and dreaming of another they are all awake now and fleeing abjectly for their lives through the narrow ways of the bee city the workers in hot pursuit the deep vibrant horror-laden note increases hour by hour as each executioner overtakes her victim she grips him by the base of the wing and helped by others all alike infuriate at the work she half drags half pushes him through the throng until she has him in the light of day and tumbles with him to the ground he forever fighting and struggling and uttering that frenzied note of fear she savagely gnawing at the wing until it is disabled and he can never more return to the hive many of the strongest drones escape from their persecutors for the time being and fly away unhurt but it is only for a few hours hunger is sure to bring them back to the hive when the waiting guards fall upon them and maim or drive them off once more it is specially to be marked that the bees never sting the drones at this great annual feast of carnage there is that much method in the madness which has seized upon them for in the rough and tumble of such a conflict stings would be plucked out by the roots and thus valuable lives would go down with the worthless the sole object seems to be to rid the hives as effectively as possible of the presence of the drones and the disablement of one wing appears to be all that is necessary and therefore all for which the deft assassin strives with some bee races the massacre of the drones is carried through in an incredibly short space of time with others the agony of the thing is drawn out for days together the wretched sires of the hive are caught between two evils each as fatal as the other if they fly off to the fields starvation and the night chills will swiftly bring about their end if they return to the hive a still speedier death awaits them night and day at this time the guard bees are doubled and redoubled at the city gates and there is little chance of the wiliest drone outwitting them but he usually takes the home hazard and sooner or later comes blundering in receiving with open arms as it were his share of the knife as huddlestone faced the carbonari all this is the common way with the bee republic when the season goes as it should and the hive is in possession of a mother bee young strong and of proved fecundity but there are times when the drones for all their great expense and drain on the wealth of the colony are suffered to live on until the late autumn or even to remain unmolested 
throughout the winter and following spring. If the bee master sees drones about a hive, when other colonies have long ago made a good riddance of them, he well knows what ails the stock. Its queen is old and failing and these astute Amazons have given reprieve to their male kind until a new mother bee can be raised and properly mated. It is a case of mercy to the drones, tempered with so much justice to themselves, that the original virtue is large discounted. And where the drones are carried through the winter, it is ever a sign that the hive is not only without a queen, but will never contrive one, of their own race. Yet they know that, in the preservation of the drones, they have at least one indispensable element for their salvation. And, who shall gainsay it of the sovereign honey-bee, perhaps they rely on the bee-master to guess their plight, and furnish them with another queen, in time to save his property from extinction. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the Feast as the year grows in the bee garden, so it goes, with all but imperceptible tread and tread. In southern England, after the seed hay is down, there is little more for the bees to do but prepare their hives for the coming winter. The queen is slowly weaned from her absorption in egg-laying by a gradual change in food. Day by day, she receives less of the mysterious bee milk which was her urging and inspiration day after day she finds herself the more constrained to slake her hunger at the open honey cells with the common crowd every day sees fewer bee children born to the hive and every day sees more and more of the old workers worn out with a short six weeks or so of summer toil, pass away in that inexplicable fashion, using, perchance, their last strength of wing to hie them to the traditional graveyard of their kind. What becomes of them all, not the wisest among bee-men knows, but it is certain that, as they lived by communal principle, in the same faith they die, and their last act may be the truly collective one of removing their own bodies out of the way of harm to the cherished state. With the waning months, the population of the hive decreases visibly, and, as their numbers fail, the temper of the bees suffers just as evident a change. Old beekeepers know by sharp experience that early autumn is a time when vigilance well repays itself. For all life, the season of autumn has its peculiar tests and trials of character, and this is especially true with regard to the honey bee. Each strain of bees has its proclivities, good or bad which are sure to come to the front at this season. And, more than any, bad qualities will show themselves, now that the rush of the year's work is over, and the common energy must take its course through an ever-shallowing and straightening way. To find rank dishonesty in a creature of so small account in creation as an insect is rather startling to old-fashioned ideas, but it is nevertheless beyond dispute than some stocks of bees are prone to develop a tendency to housebreaking and robbery of their neighbours' goods during early autumn, and, in a lesser degree, when the first scanty supply of nectar begins in early spring. 
Virgil, and almost all the classic writers, give stirring accounts of the frequent battles among bees in their day. We are told of vast conflicts taking place in mid-air, of the kings leading forth their hosts of warriors, the din of carnage, the wounded and dying falling like rain out of the blue of the summer sky. These descriptions have always been a great puzzle to modern students of bee life, because nothing of the kind seems to take place at the present day. Each hive goes about its business, apparently in complete disregard of the existence of other hives. Neither at home nor abroad in the fields are reprisals ever witnessed among bees, whether singly or collectively. The most peaceable creature in the world is the honey bee, except in the single case when her home is being wantonly assailed. But in autumn, frequent encounters take place between robber bees and the hive they are attacking, and one is constrained to believe that it is of this Virgil writes. Perhaps when once a stock has discovered that stealing honey is a much quicker and easier method of obtaining it than by the laborious process of gathering, these particular bees will never again be won back to honest courses. Not only will the parent hive continue to break out in this way at the close of every season, but all swarms from the same hive are certain to develop the like tendencies. The strain will be a continual source of annoyance and loss to the bee master, and, if he be wise, he will take the shortest and surest way of putting an end to the trouble by promptly changing the queen, and thus in the end exterminating the original stock. Where this is in his own garden, there will be no difficulty in the matter. But often the robbers are wild bees, brigands inhabiting a hollow tree in some neighbouring wood, and making sudden raids upon their law-abiding neighbours in adjacent villages, after the manner of brigands all the world over. The strangers have often a peculiar appearance, which singles them out immediately from the legitimate members of the gardens. They are darker in colour and shinier, and they have a bold yet furtive way of getting about, which suggests at once the prowling marauder. Wandering among the hives on a fine September morning, you may see several of these light-fingered, sinister folk hovering about the entrance to a hive, or trying to creep in unobserved. Their presence is promptly detected, and a sudden hubbub arises as the guard bees set upon the intruders and drive them off. There is no doubt of their intention. They are spies from the robber camp and their object is to discover those hives which are weak in population, and so will fall the easier prey to the depredators when in force. Strong stocks have little to fear from robbers. They can always hold their own against attack, and therefore are seldom molested. These scouts disappear for a time, and the hive settles down to its wonted, busy tranquillity. But soon a little blur of bees may be seen coming over the hedge top and making straight for the selected hive. There is no more crafty reconnoitring. It is to be battle undisguised. The robbers descend upon their prey, and at once a terrific uproar begins a desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight between besiegers and besieged. Left to themselves, the weak stock will have little chance from the outset. It is quickly overcome, and then, 
a curious thing often happens the bees of the home colony which have survived the fight join forces with the victors and themselves help to rifle and carry away to the robber's lair the treasure which is their own by right luckily the bee master has an all but unfailing preventative of this vexatious trouble ready to his hand he can safely leave all those hives which are numerically strong of citizens to take care of themselves and those which are weak of population he can join together in twos or threes converting them also into strong self-protective colonies the modern movable comb hive is a power in the hands of the capable bee man for the comb frames from several hives can be placed together in one and the bees will unite quite peaceably at this season if all are well dusted with a flower dredger or treated with a scent spray so that in odour and appearance they may be alike probably every hive has its own distinct odour which is shared by all its denizens and this is no doubt the means by which the sentinel bees at the entrance recognise their own comrades while they promptly fall upon all interloping strangers the preparation of the hive for the winter is of a piece with all else that the bee undertakes as the area of the brood nest shrinks the empty cells are filled with honey this being brought down from the store cells farthest away the foragers keep steadily at work whenever the weather holds gathering up the remnants of the feast and bringing them home to swell the winter larder where there is much ivy a fine october will often see the hives as busy again as ever they were in the bravest days of june but the throng of bees is manifestly smaller the rich song of life begins later in the day and lasts only during the brightest hours and that wonderful night sound the deep underground thunder of the fanning bees is gone from the bee garden just as the scent of the clover nectar brewing and steaming in the hives no longer drifts across the darkness filling the bee master's house with the fragrance he loves more than all else in the world the old ragged winged bees that have stood the brunt of the season are now too nearly all gone the hives are filled with bees of the same race inspired by the same traditions but they are at the beginning of life the raw recruits of destiny a mere stopgap crew they have no memories of the time when work was a fever a tumultuous race with the sun in which the swiftest must lag behind they have never known the over-weighty cargoes the bursting honey sacks and pollen panniers so laden that they could be scarce dragged into the hive and they will never know them these bees born late in the season have their lot cast in the torpid backwaters of their little world theirs is to be but a dreary eking out of days so that they may have strength enough to warm the first spring broods into life the few hot days that burn in the midst of the snows of each english march immeasurably far off now and unattainable seemingly will be all they will ever see of the power of sunshine winter bees are born to the prison house and in it and for it live and die at the most a worker bee sees but six months of life at the least and this is the lot of many she withstands the incessant wear and tear of her hard calling for six or possibly eight weeks 
thus though the hive may be always packed with citizens the population is forever changing half a dozen times in the year perhaps and for a score of years you may go to your bee garden and each time move among tens of thousands to whom you are an utter stranger and whom you have never seen before and yet in all its customs its propensities its traditions the life of the bees is continuity personified you may go round the world and spend ten years on the journey and coming back to the old leafy nook of the country find the old green hive still in its corner under the lilac still the centre of what seems the same crowd of winged merchant women sailing home under the same gay colours singing the old glad songs building the old wondrous fabrics in the darkness transmuting the same fragrant essences into the same elixir of gold and what is this mysterious thing called the bee commonwealth which is alone immortal while all that composes it and pertains to it and upholds it passes and dies you must not forget the queen bee here she alone it must be remembered persists year in and year out while generation after generation of her children grow up and die about her a hundred thousand of them may be in each twelve months thousands even between one single summer dawn and the dusk of the western sky methuselah of old on the more moderate human scale must have had some such experience must have divined the broader plan of life from the incessant repetitions of chance and change that pass before him the power to generalize into symbols comes only to the ancient of days and he of all men had learnt to fathom to estimate to winnow out the sober drab grain from the glittering rainbow chaff of life over and over again he must have kept the true true to itself with one wise word and turned back the false dazzled and discomfited with one flash from his mirror of the ages he was a living history book where all men might read the common drift and outcome of life and as a record of the hive story a living archive for its plans its systems its ideals the mother bee may exist today she who in comparison with its ever coming and going thousands is an age-old imperishable thing and so you may think of her in the short days of december twilight or in the interminable night darkness full of the raging of the winter wind gathering her children about her and telling them tales of their forebears prowess teaching them old bee songs which have but the one refrain of work and winning and never forgetting her own little story of the one brief hour of her love flight and marriage bought and paid for by widowhood lasting her whole life end of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Modern Bee Farm. It is well enough to consider the scientific side of hive life for its intrinsic interest, to treat it for what it really is, one of the most absorbing studies available for leisure hours but the honey-bee is something more than a wonder-maker or a peg on which to hang dilettante moralisms rightly treated and exactly understood 
she can be made of great use in the world there are two things in this england of ours which profoundly astonish all who love bees and have a true conception of their possibilities travel where you may in the land the last thing you are likely to meet with is a bee farm or even a few hives in a cottage garden while every yard of your way has its nook of blossom and every mile its stretch of flowery pasture where in sober truth tons of honey are annually running to waste all this could be garnered and sold to the people at little trouble and great profit if only enterprise would wake up from its island lethargy and stretch forth the hand but the years dribble uselessly by and nothing is done here and there a wide-awake husbandman gets a little township of hives together sells in the neighbourhood all the honey his bees make and puts to his pocket a gold and silver lining but this is only a drop in the ocean and the british people must send abroad for their honey which they do to the pretty tune of more than thirty thousand pounds a year hitherto reasoning backward from effect to cause it would seem that farming has been remunerative only when undertaken on a large scale but those who can read the signs of the times tell us that the age just dawning to the countryside will be the age of the small man and this must mean that the hereditary aristocracy among crops wheat oats barley will slowly give place to little culture in a word that the land will be made to produce not the things that tradition and our yeoman family pride have ordained as the be-all and end-all of farming but the minor humble necessities for which each town and village should look to the good brown earth immediately about it but at present looks in vain farmers ladies may then no longer sit in their drawing-rooms and ride in their carriages but that will be a change for the simpler more proportionate those who live in towns have little conception of it but the country dweller knows well what complexity and luxury have got into the old english farmhouses for all the outcry about hard times how the farmer's wife no longer goes to her dairy nor makes any of the good old farmhouse things that serve to uphold country england in days gone by and how the master agriculturalists now are the sinews of the great london stores while the little local shopkeepers are left to the field labourer with his twelve or fifteen shillings a week for the class of smallholders that must now multiply throughout the length and breadth of the land there is awaiting an enterprise a source of livelihood as yet hardly tapped a stock subject of envy with most artisans is the capitalist who leads an easy life while his factory hands toil for him but if the smallholder will take up beekeeping he too can look on to a large extent while his thousands of winged labourers are filling his storehouse with some of the most useful and saleable merchandise in the world it is a truism in commerce that a good supply creates a demand just as certainly as that the universal want of a thing stimulates its production one of the needs in england to-day is a full good and cheap supply of honey and when this is forthcoming there will be little fear but that the present demand will increase hand over hand there are many reasons why the people should choose honey for their principal food 
rather than the beet sugar which is now so largely consumed in the first place honey is a pure natural undoctored sweet while in the manufacture of ordinary sugar the use of more or less noxious chemicals seems to be indispensable when a stock of bees must be artificially fed and common grocer's sugar is used for the purpose the result is generally that half the stock is poisoned by the chemicals with which the sugar has been treated at the mill and if this is its effect on bees the inference must be that it cannot prove altogether wholesome for men but its purity is not the chief reason why honey should be the universal sweet food of the people Honey is the ordinary sugar of nectar concentrated and converted into what is chemically known as grape sugar, and thus, in ripe honey, the first and most important part of digestion is already effected before it leaves the comb. This explains why so many delicate people, and particularly children, can assimilate food sweetened with honey when they can take no other form of sweet doctors are continually finding some new virtue in honey its gently regulating action has been long known and there is good authority for stating that there is not an organ in the human body which does not benefit from its habitual use in all wasting diseases and triumphantly in consumption it will prevail as an upbuilder when everything else fails there is no doubt at all that cases of consumption have been entirely cured by a liberal diet of honey and notoriously honey is the main ingredient in nearly all patent medicines for diseases of the chest and throat therapeutic hints from laymen are generally looked upon askance by medical men at least by those of the old-fashioned type yet on the chance that this page may come under the eye of some of the more elastic-minded the thing may be hazarded there are many who believe in it and with good reason as a sovereign specific where the disease is a wasting one it is nothing else than the once famous athole brose which as all scottish beekeepers know consists of equal parts of good thick honey preferably from lingheather and of cream and of mature scotch whisky from the pot still little and often is the rule for its administration but unlike most old wives remedies faith has nothing to do with its wonder working scepticism is a soil in which it seems to flourish as well as any the man of business resolved to take up beekeeping as a livelihood must at the outset decide on what scale he will carry the matter through there are two aspects of the thing each more alluring than the other according to the temperament and point of view there is the simple life and the bee garden a life spent in the green quiet of an english village within reach of a market town where the produce of the hives may be disposed of and there is the greater enterprise the foundation of a bee farm on an extensive scale and on the most approved scientific principles where the object is to supply the great central markets at a distance rather than the immediate local needs in the establishment of a bee farm the first care must be the choice of a suitable district the nature of the surrounding country must largely govern the systems on which the farm can be most profitably worked the first maxim in successful beemanship 
is to get all hives filled to the brim with worker bees by the time the great honey flow sets in this time however varies according to the district in the orchard country we need bees early in heather districts we want them late in south-west england where the country is half fruit ground and half moorland the hives must be huge in population both late and early but where the beekeeper follows the sheep farmer and there is no better guide to honey than the sheep his true policy is to work his colony slowly and steadily up to their greatest strength by the time the main feed crops come into blossom which is seldom before the middle of may and all these considerations land us on the brink of a very vexed question in modern beecraft whether bees should be artificially fed and if so how and when if only the purest cane sugar is used and the syrup well boiled and never burnt there is nothing to say against the practice on the score of harm to the stocks where early bees are wanted it is absolutely necessary to give them a continuous supply of sugar syrup from the first moment that breeding commences in the hives chemically the sweet constituent in nectar is almost identical with that from the sugar cane and sugar syrup has this advantage over honey given that it more nearly simulates the natural flow the bees responsible for the nursery work in the hive and the regulation of the queen's fecundity are young bees that have never yet flown they can therefore only judge of the progress of the season by the amount of nectar and pollen coming into the hive where this is steadily increasing day by day and it is this regular natural progress in prosperity which the beekeeper must strive to imitate in artificial feeding the nurse bees gain confidence and brood raising forges rapidly ahead but sugar syrup and pea flour are not natural foods for bees and there is little doubt that a prolonged course of such diet tends to lower the tone and stamina of the race and thus may prepare the way for disease the golden rule in the matter seems to be that artificial feeding should be resorted to only where strength of stocks is necessary to secure the harvest or where actual starvation threatens in purely heather districts when the big population is quite early enough if it is to hand in late june nothing short of imminent starvation should induce the bee master to give artificial and therefore unavoidably inferior food in sheep country the same rule holds except in the most unfavourable years a hive headed by a young and vigorous queen can be relied upon to get itself into the finest fettle by the time the main crops are ready for exploitation in this case the bee man has only to make certain from time to time that no stock is in absolute want of the ordinary means of subsistence but in those warm favoured regions of the southwest the lands of the apple blossom and the heather where there is a very early and a very late harvest to be gathered a different system must be pursued here we touch on the second grand principle of successful beekeeping the necessity for having in all hives only the most prolific mother bees for profitable honey getting a queen should seldom be kept beyond her second year after that she is usually of little account and should be superseded either by the bee master or the bees 
but where a queen has been overstimulated by feeding to raise an immense population in the spring of the year she is rarely capable of another supreme effort in the autumn the best policy therefore if the heather harvest is an important one is to remove the old queens as soon as the spring work is over and to substitute for them queens that are in their best season but at the beginning of their resources instead of at the end in this way another huge army of workers is soon born to the hive and the double harvest is secured on the question of the best hive to use in commercial beekeeping on either a large or small scale it is hard to particularize generalization however is not difficult here every bee master has his own ideas as to details but all are happily agreed on the main constructive principles experience has fairly well decided that a good queen under the modern system of intensive culture will require for her brood a comb surface of about eighteen hundred square inches a brood nest of smaller capacity than this is liable to cramp her operations at their highest and anything in excess of it will simply mean so much new honey lost to the new super chambers where alone the bee master requires it honey stored in the brood nest except during the off season is loss instead of gain the best hive therefore will contain just as many brood combs in movable frames as will ensure the right capacity and all comb frames throughout the bee farm must be of the same size so that they will be strictly interchangeable among the various hives this is a vital point in successful bee culture because it enables the master not only to equalize the strength of his stocks by transferring combs of hatching brood from one to the other but he can also give to penurious stocks frames of sealed honey from the abundance of their neighbours and he can unite the weak colonies thus rendering all strong for the rest the hives must be so made that heat will be perfectly retained in the cold season and as perfectly excluded during the sultriest time of the year double walls round the brood chamber are a necessity in the changeable british climate where chilly days are always probable during ten months out of the twelve as well as honey production the bee farmer will find an equal source of profit in the production of wax just as there is nothing like leather beeswax holds its own as a marketable commodity in spite of paraffin substitutes but if it is almost universally degraded by adulteration the fault lies with the bee men who have never seriously attempted to meet the demand for it wax production on a large scale is perfectly feasible and there is little doubt that it could be developed into an important british industry as it used to be in medieval days yet these are times of revolution the honey-bee may yet find herself entirely restored to her old national avocation of bringing light to our darkness and to our bodies one of the best and purest of foods End of chapter 16chapter 17 of the law of the honeybee by tickna edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain beekeeping and the simple life it is a quality of english sunshine that it comes and goes capriciously so that no man may be sure of the comradeship 
of his shadow from day to day but when there is sunshine in england it always seems an abiding permanent force the grey of yesterday and the patter song of the rain on the leaves were only a dream you were sleeping under the changeless blue of a summer night and had but a vision of weeping drab skies gone now with the joy that comes in the morning and to-morrow when perhaps the old wild scurry of storm cloud is alive overhead and all the house resounds with the runnel music from the pouring eaves still it will be only a dream of a surety you will tell yourself so as the sun breaks through the griddle of cloud and the wind relents and the dutchman can get to his tailoring and when you are stepping out amidst the swamp and glitter and rehabilitation of life as glad of it all as the finches and butterflies that sweep on before you down the lane the sun shines you know it has always shone changeless as time itself with such a faith unfounded and therefore incontestable i came under the glow of one brave june morning threading field after field of blossoming clover until i stood at the gate of the bee garden over against the hill with its name i had long been familiar for in the county paper there was always the little five-line advertisement quaintly worded announcing honey for sale but i had never yet seen it nor indeed ever set foot in this part of the good sussex land so on this brimming june morning giving rein for once to the indolent shanks's mare of moods that is fated to carry me i set out into the bright sloth the joyous hastelessness of the day and came at length to my destination to the bee garden that nestles under the green downland hills it was girt about with a tall hedge of hawthorn smothered in snow-like blossom with just that rosy tinge upon it which is the first hectic of decay beyond the hedge i could see stretching aloft green apple boughs whose full-blown posies were alive with the desperate humming energy of countless bees there was a blue wisp of smoke trailing idly away from a chimney stack all that could be seen of the snug thatched cottage within and there were voices a leisurely baritone a sudden peal of laughter high-pitched and obviously a woman's and now and then a bar or two or an old song sung in an intermittent absent-minded way in one of the pauses of this song i raised the latch of the gate its sharp click drew to its full lean height a figure at the end of the garden which was bending down in the midst of a wilderness of hives as the man came towards me coatless his rolled-up shirt-sleeves bearing wiry brown arms to the hot june sun i took in all the busy quiet picture the red tiled winding path the sea of old-fashioned garden flowers on every hand billows of lilac and red may and laburnum shadowy blue deeps of forget-me-nots scarlet tulips amidst them like lighthouses and drifting shallows of amber mignonette a decent house stood hard by its windows bright and clean as diamond facets there was a gay flicker of linen on a line beyond an old dog lolled in a straw-filled barrel a cat kept company with a milk-jug on the spotless doorstep 
and everywhere there were beehives each of a different harmonious shade of colour not ranged in stilted rows but scattered here and there in twos and threes in the orderless order beloved of bees and unsuburban men the bee master had keen grey eyes set deep in a sun-blackened honest face and the ever-ready tongue of him was that of the beeman all the world over he was ripe and willing to talk of his work explaining what he was and what he had done as we slowly wandered through his domain he was a londoner he told me at least that was his fate half a dozen years ago a city clerk pale as the ledger leaves that fluttered through his fingers from nine to six of the working day and at home in a dreary desert of housetops called nunhead whither may an unkind fate never lure me his sisters sewed for a living white-faced as himself but one day in an old second-hand bookshop he lit upon a threepenny treasure a book on the management of bees he read it as his train crawled homeward on one stifling freezing fog-bound winter's night and there and then in the mean dirty cattle box of a third-class carriage in fancy was inaugurated the bee garden that has since developed into all i saw around me on that brave morning in june it was a long time in the doing he told me as we sauntered among the busy hives speaking with a delightful sussex intonation already veneered upon his cockney brogue a long and weary and scraping time there was money to be saved the capital needed for the enterprise and this was no easy matter out of a total family income of forty shillings a week but at last it was done and well done there came a day when the three of them shook the dust of nunhead from their feet and took over possession of the little tumble-down cottage with its bare half-acre of neglected ground well those were hard times to begin with he said with an unaccountable relish in the recollection but now look how all has changed he waved a triumphant proudly proprietary arm about him the cottage was sound and well furnished throughout the three or four bought hives with which he had started his business had multiplied into sixty or seventy all made by his own hands where had he got the bees well that threepenny book had taught him a secret the art of bee driving nearly all the cottagers for miles round were in the habit of sulphuring their bees to get at the honey the first autumn and every autumn since then he had gone to his neighbours and told them he would take the bees out of the hives for them and leave them all the combs and a good trink geld into the bargain if they would let him have the bees for his trouble and they were more than willing and thus he had gradually built up his little principality of hives but the profit of the thing this indeed was nothing much to boast of he sold all the honey and wax he got sending it away for the most part by post and extending the circle of his custom by little and little with every year taking the bad years with the good he had made a net return of two pounds for every hive in bumper seasons it was always much more it was not a great deal but there were only three of them and their wants were simple their greatest needs fresh air 
peace and quiet, the healthful life of the country, these were to be had for nothing at all. And as for clothes, you never know, until you give over trying to keep up appearances, how very little appearances count in the world. At any rate, for them, the whole thing was a complete success. There were men round about that countryside who farmed whole provinces and still grumbled. But here was he, getting peace and plenty from half an acre. And as for the girls, they did nothing but laugh and sing all day long. Thus we wandered and talked, and I, feigning ignorance of bee matters, lest he might think I was but carrying coals to Newcastle in clumsy charity, bought honey and asked many questions, and slowly the entire meaning of what had been done by these emancipated slaves of city clerkdom was revealed. The bee-master pushed his old straw hat back over his clever forehead, and lit the most comfortable pipe I had ever set eyes on. He had evidently thought the whole thing out long ago, and got it down to its essential elements. What we are doing here, he said, could be done by hundreds of others who are still in London in what was once our old plight. Large bee farms are all very well, but they are more or less a thing of the future, something that is still to be evolved out of twentieth century needs. But the bee garden has its immediate use and place in every district where there is an average population. People generally have got out of the habit of eating honey because it is so seldom on sale in the shops. But if you steadily and continuously remind them of it, they will buy, and soon grow to wonder how they did without it for so long. But it must be set before them in an attractive way. Run honey must be bright and pure to look at, and neatly bottled and labelled. If you sell honey in the comb, the section boxes must be spotlessly clean and white. In that old book that first led me to beekeeping, it says that only the English bee should be kept, because it is a better honey gatherer. But, from the salesman's point of view, there is a much more weighty reason for abjuring all foreign strains of bees. English bees leave a thin film of air between the honey and the cell cappings, and the result is that the comb always looks perfectly white. But nearly all foreigners fill their cells to the brim, and this means that the finest honeycomb will have a dark and dirty appearance, and no one will be tempted to buy. That is the sort of thing a businessman thinks of first, so the old training days in London have not been altogether without their use even here. The song, aloof and desultory, that I had heard from the garden gate, was growing clearer as we walked, and now we turned the house corner and came upon more hives, with a neat girlish figure busy among them, and, hard by, a tiny laundry shed, wherein I caught a glimpse of brown arms deep in a wash-tub, and heard the last stanza of the vagulous song. Hetty there, explained the bee-master, helps in the garden, and, helps, did I say, why, she is far and away a better hand at it than I. There is so much in hive work that needs the light touch which only a woman can give. And Deborah, she keeps house for us. Did you know that the word Deborah was Hebrew for a honeybee? But come and see, 
where i make the hives on winter days and where we sling the honey and fill the super crates with the sections and all the rest of it he showed me then his workshop and a little gauze windowed shed where there was a homemade honey extractor a cunning centrifugal thing by which the combs could be emptied and restored unbroken to the bees to be charged again and again and there was a storehouse where long rows of honey jars and stacks of sections and blocks of pale yellow wax were waiting for the purchaser and a packing shed where the post boxes of corrugated cardboard were made up finally there was pointed out to me in a far-off corner of the garden a donkey shaggy well fed placidly browsing and under a neighbouring pent roof a little cart that was a curiosity in its way its wooden tilt was made to represent a big beehive and on it was painted the name of the bee garden and a list of hive products which it carried for sale the bee master put an admiring hand upon it it was all hetty's idea he said london girls for pluck you know and she goes into the town with it once a fortnight in the season takes it away crammed full mind and never brings back an ounce somehow or other i think those girls ought to change names journeying back to the railroad station under the eternal english sunshine and through the chain of blossoming fields i listened to the chant of the bees around me and though it was the familiar sound of a lifetime there was something in it then which i had never heard before the rich note rose and fell died down to silence as the path led through impregnable red clover swelled again as the land paled to the rosy hue of the sainfoin burst out into a loud glad symphony where a patch of charlock blent its despised uncoveted gold with the farmer's drill you thought you knew our ways of life from alpha to omega so seemed to run in fancy the wavering refrain you have pried upon us day and night in season and out of season you have chloroformed us vivisected us torn our dead sisters limb from limb to feed the cruel glittering eyes of that binocular of yours you have come at last to think that there was nothing about us within or without or round about that you had not got to know and here a common city clerk turned tail on his hereditary duty has shown you in one short hour a whole sheaf of things about us which you peeping tom that you are in a whole life's keyhole prying have never guessed out upon you you deserve to have to do with nothing better than bumblebees for the rest of your days for the more i thought of little bee gardens such as the one i had just visited established here there and everywhere throughout the land the plainer it became that this after all was a mission for the honey-bee that had quite escaped me and the fonder of the idea i grew with bee-keeping on a grand scale there was the difficulty that an apiary might become too large for the resources of the country about it although it is all but certain that crops grown specially for bees can be made to pay but a small garden could never exhaust the land within its necessary three-mile radius and all the nectar its bees could gather would be obtained free 
Nunhead has done it gloriously, thought I, tramping steadily onward through the clover. And why not all the other Nunheads that hem in the great cities? There must be plenty who love the dust and din and are willing to stop there. So the little band of bee gardeners will never be missed. And there was something else I thought of too, as I strode along under the English sunshine, which lasts forever, swinging my box of superfluous yet much prized honey as I went. The song and that pleasant ripple of laughter, they were in my ears still, and mingling with the labour song of the wayside bees. Now, only a dozen miles or so, away over the hilltops in the blue Sussex weald, I knew of just such another bee garden, where two brothers, not Londoners this time, but true-born downland lads, had well established themselves, were getting comfortably off, but were still single men. And only a week ago, they had deplored this fact to me, and, but hold, matchmaking was never yet to be reckoned part of the law of the honeybee. End of chapter 17 End of the law of the honeybee by Tigna Edwards